Perfect. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our ESEA office hour for September. We hope you had a wonderful start to the new year and are looking forward to providing you with some information and timely reminders. All right, kick us off. Uh, monitoring is officially open for FY25 in grants for me. If you are an SAU who's still wondering maybe what your monitoring status is, just a quick reminder, if you look at that screenshot on the right, you can find that information on your GAN in your ESC application and grants for me. We're hosting a training this afternoon that hopefully you've already pre-registered for. If you are a medium or high level of support district at three o'clock, we're gonna walk through all of the monitoring items, the requirements and how the system works. So we hope to see you there, but it will also be recorded if for some reason you can't join us. And if you were with us last month, I did mention this, but just one last time, want to sort of shout out that we've updated the Title IIa spending snapshot with a lot more of the allowable and unallowable uses of funds for Title II that we've sort of learned about here in the last few years. Uh, and we'll drop a link to that in the chat shortly. Hi, good morning, folks. Um, so the Title III snapshot has also been updated. Um, after some conversation with the U.S. Department of Ed um, in relation to <clears throat> some findings that we had on our audit uh, last year. And so initially they had, it had appeared that um, Title III funds were not allowed to support um, ESOL certification for um, staff members. And so we just recently were able to clarify that. And what they said was that um, the civil rights requirement to have an ESOL certified teacher um, in your district um, is the requirement. Uh, anything in addition to that um, is supplemental. So you are allowed to use Title III funds to get additional staff um, ESOL certified. So just wanted to clear that up, folks. We also wanted to draw your attention to a webinar that we are having tomorrow. So if you are an SAU that has a non-public within your boundaries, our process for acquiring the data associated with Title I equitable services is changing for FY26. So these dates are gonna be very important for everyone involved, our non-publics as well as our accompanying SAUs. So please join us tomorrow at 1030 to discuss how to collect the data, what data is going to need to be collected, and how to support your non-publics in particular related to this new changing process for Title I equitable services. Good morning, folks. Uh, this is a friendly reminder that the Title IA separate ESEA grant for summer programming um, has a deadline for its performance report uh, due 1030. And I just wanted to give folks plenty of time so that those funds can be obligated um, and that that grant can maybe not be sort of in the way of ESEA consolidated performance report that's around the same deadline. Um, so just note that you can get into the application you can um, go to revision started. Um, you will see one performance report page. It's much minor compared to our ESCA consolidated, but you're still going to report on program details. So teacher, student attendance, um, the outcomes of the goals that you had written in as part of the uh, application for this grant. And then of course your total expenditures. Uh, I will say most, some districts do spend down every fund they budget for, some don't. There is a checkbox to signify that really invoicing has been completed and any funds that have been unspent are being returned. Um, so just be sure, even though it's not a long page, take time to read through and understand. In fact, our district is really done with invoicing. We really are returning the funds. Um, and I would say now it may be good to just check that your business manager is able to invoice against what's been budgeted 
because recently I have been approving budget revisions as folks sort of finalize and realize what are the amounts um, that they asked for versus uh, what the amounts are that they really needed um, and spent in those categories. So you can make a revision at any time. I have been approving those. All of that to say so that you can close out the performance port report by the end of October and really be done with invoicing and have sort of completed the closeout of this grant. Um, you can always reach out to me if you have questions about the Title I-A summer um, grant and programming. Um, this is a friendly reminder. Uh, I know for folks who have been monitored or are going to be monitoring, we're going to talk a lot about these today, this afternoon. So, um, But I do want to make the announcement for all folks because Title I uh, has quite a few sort of specific family engagement requirements outlined in statute. And for the most part, I know folks really have gotten into a cadence and rhythm to make sure they're doing this. Um, obviously, know whether you have school-wide or targeted programs and understanding sort of how to meet these requirements. Um, your parents' right to know letter should go out early in the school year this month, right, where they just, you basically outline that they have a right to know um, that they can ask for assessment policies, they can ask for teacher qualifications at any time, and contact information on who to ask. It might be the building principal, for example. Um, Title I annual meeting, right, that in a targeted program, you're meeting with your Title I students and their parents, um, and then in a school-wide, right, that it's part of your back-to-school nights or part of your open houses, part of your annual meeting to explain and talk about your Title I programming and what you do with your ESEA funds or your Title I funds. Um, and then the school parent compact, I often see it in a handbook or part of the school level family engagement policies. This really should be looked at periodically, maybe posted on the site with uh, opportunities for parents to provide feedback. But essentially this compact talks about the importance of communication and the expectations around what the parents should be doing, what the student and what the school will be doing in order to fully support students uh, at the school. Uh, cool. Is this uh, me still? All right. Nope. Nope. It's me, Rita. And you <laughs> teed it up perfectly, though, by mentioning the performance report earlier. So as Rita alluded to, the FY24 ESCA performance report is going to open up uh, right on 10-1. Those pages should populate when you start a revision in grants for me. The performance report will be due on 11-1. What you're going to see if you're sort of new to the process is that we ask for outcomes on the goals that were established in the FY24 application. We have some data for especially Title I that's relevant to our EdFax reports we have to submit. And perhaps most importantly is a reporting out on all expenditures of FY24 funds from your date of substantial approval through 93024. So this is a great time to be checking in with the business office and making sure they are invoicing for those FY24 funds. That's probably the biggest delay we see in folks getting an approved performance report. If you don't have an approved performance report, you cannot bill for anything after that 9-30-24 uh, time frame. And we had some folks last year who had to have invoicing paused for all fiscal years until they got that FY24 or their FY23 last year funds all caught up. So something we want to stay on top of, make sure we get done because it does have that 11-1 deadline. If you have a non-public school, there's also a reconciliation form you do. Uh, to work with because they're very limited options in terms of carryover funds for non-public schools. They really should be using up all of their equitable services uh, through that 930 deadline and then using FY25 moving forward. So make sure you're talking with them. If they have some access to equitable services left, now would be the time to make sure that they are using that so that they don't uh, perhaps have to return that access to the public school district. Also, as a reminder, part of any performance report is closing out a grant we may still have available. So in this case, we're closing out FY22. So your SAU wants to make sure if you had any FY22 funds remaining, that you are invoicing for those because they have to be obligated by 9-30-24. I'm sure Tyra is probably going to repeat this. So you're going to hear it a couple of times. Then they have to be invoiced for by the end of this calendar year. Uh, that is a hard stop. There is no access to funds after that. And you'll have to start a revision to your FY22 application, report out on all expenditures. You're sort of adding to what you did in the FY22 performance report, submitting it to MDOE, and then we can close it out. If you're new or if you're a veteran and all of this still feels a little bit overwhelming, we are going to spend a good chunk of our office hour in October 
going through the performance report pages sort of as a live training for you. Of course, those are recorded as well. So we'll talk a little bit more about that next month. But just now, be thinking about it, gathering the data you might need, as well as getting the business office to submit those reimbursement requests. So as we talk about reporting and whatnot, we also want to touch base this morning on the FY25 uh, ESA application. Uh, so just a couple of friendly reminders. The application was due to the department on August 1st. So we're a little bit uh, about a month or so beyond uh, that initial deadline. So um, if your SAU does not have final approval on your application at this point, uh, it's a really good time to be reviewing any comments or feedback you've received on your application and working to get those resubmitted for uh, final approval as soon as you can. Um, in terms of the uh, procedure for submission, I just want to remind folks that um, there is kind of this multi-step approval process uh, before an application is officially considered submitted to the department. Um, so in addition to marking it draft complete, uh, you're both your uh, business manager and superintendent need to electronically certify the application. Um, and just a special note that if it's your initial submission, uh, you do also need to make sure that your building principals are certifying your individual school project pages. And they would do that by logging into the application, um, going to the um, project budget page for the school that they're the principal for. And there's a little certification button right there for them to, to go in and do their electronic certification. Um, so just kind of a quick rundown here. In Maine, we have just shy of 200 school districts that receive ESCA funds. As of a day or so ago, about 50 of our SAUs have final approval. Um, there's about 40% of folks that are somewhere in the process of um, being updated for resubmission. Um, and we do have a small number, about 8% of folks who've not yet started or not yet put forth an initial submission for an application. Uh, if you fall in that camp, it's very important that you get that work moving forward and you get an, at least an initial submission into us as soon as you can, um, because that does dictate what your earliest possible substantial approval date is for FY25, uh, which impacts when you can begin to obligate funds for, for new year expenses. So particularly if you're in a situation where you may not have a lot of carryover funding to leverage from prior fiscal years, you'll wanna make sure that you get your application in as soon as you can um, so that there's no lapse in funding between uh, fiscal years. And then just another friendly reminder of some resources we have available online. If you're a relatively new ESEA coordinator, or maybe it's been a while since you worked on the application and you just want a refresher, uh, we do have some recorded uh, training materials and resources for you to access. I just shared a link in chat. Uh, feel free to, to pull that up, browse through things. Um, we do have some videos and whatnot uh, with regard to the application and um, some resources around submission workflow and things like that. But of course, if you do have questions as you're working on the application, always feel free to reach out to your regional program manager. Good morning, everyone. Um, as Ryan alluded to, I am going to reiterate the importance of getting your FY24 invoicing in for expenses incurred through 930-24. That way you can report them out as needed on your FY24 performance report. Grants for me is only allows the SAU to submit one invoice at a time for each title until that invoice receives the status of state accounting system paid. And I do wanna let you know that the um, service center is um, experienced some delays due to new staffing training. Um, but we hope that they will get back on track shortly by the end of this week. The FY22 ESEA funds, it's now is the time to um, draw down those funds. They are expiring 930-24. Um, as you look to use your remaining funds, please make sure you are not um, 
purchasing subscriptions or entering into a contract for services to be provided in the FY uh, 25 uh, school 24 25 school year it this is not allowed um, for the FY 22 um, funds FY 23 Tier three school improvement funds can be obligated through 930 as well. All federal funds expiring 930-24 need to be liquidated by 1230-24. FY25 ESEA funds, this is just your friendly reminder that um, you should not be entering into any contracts for services, subscriptions, licenses, um, before your substantial approval date on your FY25 application. The um, period of performance is 7-124 to 9-30-26. This means that all services that you contract for need to be provided with, within those dates. So it's your substantial approval date through 9-30-26. Uh, I am getting a lot of questions from SAU saying, but the service isn't going to be provided until, you know, the fall or early next year. This still applies. Okay. You cannot enter the contract until after your substantial approval date. When entering invoices into grants for me, if you get an error message on your expenditure page, um, that and it's due to not having um, enough funds budgeted in that particular category, please don't just throw them into a category that you have funds in. Um, this happens, I see this quite frequently when it comes to salary and benefits. Your trial balance splits your salaries and benefits up, and that is the way it needs to be recorded um, on the expenditure page. If this happens, if you get this error message, a budget revision in the application is necessary. Um, just open up your application, make the budget revisions, resubmit, and your RPM will review and approve. Once that is uh, approved, it will then show up on the invoicing side for you to make the correction to your request and resubmit for consideration. Uh, this slide is a great resource. I encourage everyone in the business office to uh, print it that it's a friendly reminder of the period of performance for all open grants at this time that uh, ESEA oversees. And the bold are the ones that are expiring. So please make a note, make a um, date on your calendar to review these um, grants and get your invoices in for them as soon as possible. So this is just some fun money facts. The FY22 ESEA funds, the amount that was awarded was just under 69 million, the funds budgeted. So this means that, um, all the SAUs that had awards uh, for FY22 ESEA funds, that is the amount that was budgeted. And you can draw down from the budgeted uh, amount. Funds paid to date, 68 million. That's great. We're, we're down to 1% of the grant is remaining. Uh, the FY23 um, tier three school improvement funds, Close to 2.5 was awarded, 2.3 was budgeted, and we are down to 36% of that award is remaining to be invoiced for. Please get your invoices in as soon as possible. Like I said, um, due to the operations of Grants for Me, you can only submit one invoice at a time for up to uh, three months. 
uh, for the service period. So we really need to get those invoices in as soon as possible as it's taken about 30 days for the turnaround time right now. Federal fiscal office hours are going to resume September 26. Um, I encourage anyone that handles federal funds or federal programs to attend. You need to register for the meeting, um, which the registration can be found on the DOE events calendar. And bring all your fiscal, uh, federal fiscal questions as we embark on a new school year. Let's make it a successful one. We are very excited to announce that we are bringing the Brewman Group um, to Maine for a training in October. This is a, um, the Brewman Group is a law firm that specializes in federal grants compliance on the Office of Management and Budget or OMB, Uniform Grant Guidance or UGG, and as well as the Education Department, General Administration Regulations, EGGER, and the General Education Provisions Act, GEPA. This is an opportunity that should not be missed, and the best part is it's free to attend. All travel expenses will be the responsibility of the district um, to participate. We also wanted to provide everyone with a friendly reminder that the ARP ESER emergency relief funds are also coming to an end with the same date of 9.30 as obligation and invoicing as quickly as possible after that. Um, we do have a team of folks working in a non, working in that program with a no agenda walk-in office hour. They're hosted at Tuesday, 9 a.m., and they will continue to host those walk-in no agenda office hours through October 1st. There's no need to um, sign up, but you do need to re register so that you can have the link and the link will allow you to join at any time between 9 to 10 a.m. every Tuesday through October 1st. So again, we always encourage you to visit the professional learning calendar within the department's website. It does provide an array of opportunities to engage in learning with our colleagues. Here is our contact information in regards to your regional program manager. We also wanna be sure that you have avenues to visit all of the wonderful work that the Maine Department of Education is doing collectively as a team. So here are all of our social media platforms. We are going to open it up for questions and answers. The team has been monitoring the chat box and has addressed all questions to this time and I encourage you to unmute yourself if you have any other additional questions. <laughs> 